Um, thank you, everybody, for coming today. Uh, welcome to Crowdfund 2020, where you're going to learn how to ensure that your product is delivered to your backers on time and as promised. And we'll have the opportunity to learn a bit about what gets in the way and ways you can bypass that. So all the best practices, you're in really good shape with the speaker and guests that we have available. So uh, yeah, so this is official, an official event of Global Entrepreneurship Week. This week, there are over 170 countries participating and uh, running 30, over 35,000 events and with over 10,000 people participating. So all of you are a part of that. Um, and it's pretty fun to have that engagement. In fact, within this audience uh, ourselves here, we've, we represent 11 different countries and four different continents. And uh, we also should have a live stream audience and uh, that we could have people from all over the world joining us. We had uh, quite a bit of interest from Brazil. So we will take questions for those of you who are online through the chat. And um, we'll also be taking questions here live during the panel portion as well. So with that, uh, the, the great challenge, uh, we face great challenges worldwide and entrepreneurs and the ecosystems that, uh, fit, that address these challenges and drive positive change are so important. One of the challenges is that uh, at the current time, not all of the resources that are available are available to all demographics. And one of the great things about crowdfunding is that uh, it does cut across all demographics. There, uh, when crowdfunding started in 1997, uh, I believe, the um, uh, uh, it started off with a, a band getting uh, doing a crowdfund uh, for an event that they were doing, and right now. Uh, there's more than 600 different crowdfunding platforms, so it truly does democratize funding of uh, ventures and products coming to market. And um, so, a lot of a lot of focus is on how do you get the cr crowdfunding campaign going? How do you uh, get the uh, funding that you want? And there's a lot of emphasis on that portion. What we're going to look at today is what happens once you do get funded, how do you ensure that you deliver to your backers according to what you said you were going to do? And how do you communicate with them if there's challenges? Because uh, there's risk with entrepreneurship, we know that. And so there's no guarantee when a concept is backed that uh, everything is going to work out. But there are things that you can do as a creator to help ensure that things flow smoothly um, in that direction. So uh, our goal today is to tap into the knowledge of the key, keynote speaker that we have and also our great panelists. And so without further ado, uh, let's go ahead and jump right into that. So our keynote speaker today is Tim Durr. Tim Durr is a natural born enigmatic leader who embodies the entrepreneurial spirit combined with the ability to scale companies to exponential growth. His track record and diverse grasp of finance, management, product development, and human relations has garnered trust and accolades among colleagues and his community. Tim formerly served as VP of Finance for the e-commerce startup FastSpring, leading the finance and operation departments to achieve an all-cash sale of over 600 times their original bootstrapped investment. After Fast Spring, Tim became COO of Tracker, where he built and managed customer support, operations, HR, and finance. He built systems and processes to manage their team, who shipped millions of packages to consumers, and he scaled the company's sales from $1 million to $50 million in 24 months. He also managed the manufacture of over 6 million devices and worked on a team that secured over 60 million in Series A and B financing. 
Tim is currently CEO and founder of Rad Sourcing, which helps startups navigate all areas of operations with a major focus on manufacturing. In addition to consulting, Tim is also creating and preparing to launch several of his own products. So please give a warm welcome to Tim Durr. Thanks. Hello. Hi, guys. How you doing? Um, yeah, I didn't know you were going to read the whole bio. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Um, we uh, I wrote, wrote that a few years ago. It's we've done I think nine million devices after uh, after that was done. So um, and I think that bio is kind of pretty self focused. Uh, I certainly had great team members helping me with all those things, and I was just uh, a good part of it. So um, we're here to talk about um, manufacturing and helping with crowdsourcing. Um, the bio did a good job at that. Uh, let's talk about crowdfunding and just kind of give a um, kind of what I believe uh, kind of why people choose crowdfunding. You know, first of all, you're going to raise funds. That's pretty obvious. Um, you want to raise funds. But I want, I want everybody to realize that a lot of people think, hey, you know, I see all these companies raising millions of dollars on their campaign. It's great. They had this idea. They, they raised millions of dollars. They, they have a business, right? Uh, they didn't have to raise, sell any equity or invest any personal money. How, you know, no, uh, you have to buy ads. You have to do prototypes. You still have to raise money. And, uh, but, you know, it, it's a good way to raise funds. And I, I've talked to a lot of people. I don't. I personally have never talked to anybody who's actually made a profit on crowdfunding, um, but it's it's a good it's a good way to to, to launch your product. Uh, marketing reach. You know these these platforms. There's 600 platforms now. They all have a user base. They all have, you know, I think Indiegogo has what was it, 10 million email subscribers. So you get to utilize that. But again, like I said. You still need to do marketing. There's six million. Last year, there was six million campaigns done. So you're one of those six million. People aren't just going to find you. You got to sell to them. You got to do marketing. Um, market validation. Uh, so yeah, you're gonna you're going to uh, you have this idea. You got proof of concept. You're gonna um, if you do well on crowdfunding, you know that you have a consumable product that people are going to buy. Um, you get to do marketing and pricing testing. So a lot of people um, take advantage of this. And, and crowdfunding, not only are you raising funds, but you're also figuring out what works and what doesn't work with your campaign. So uh, I, I like it when uh, you do A-B testing on pricing, figure out the correct price point. Um, you gain net promoters. So that, this is an important thing. I think... A net promoter is somebody that loves your your brand and your product, and they uh, they'll tell it to their friends. You know, they'll tell it to their relatives. Um, I think probably ninety nine. This is just I'm coming up with ninety nine percent, but ninety nine percent of people that that back your product are starting out as net promoters. They are not getting something for six months, a year, whatever it is. They're giving you their hard earned money. And uh, you're you're entering a relationship with them, saying, "I will deliver this product at some point." They love your product so much that they're willing to do this. So um, you get to it's your job to keep them as net promoters because they can easily turn into detractors, and I've seen that. Um, you know, and then of course you get to launch your product. So I just kind of wanted to start out with my introduction to uh, crowdfunding. Um, I knew about crowdfunding, but I think somebody on my Facebook shared a uh, a video of of this this thing called Coin. Um, it's a credit card that you can put all your credit cards in, and you know, take all your credit cards out of your wallet, and uh, and just use this one card for all your cards. At this, it was before Apple Pay, any of that stuff. It was my you know my wallet is huge, uh, bursting at the seams. I, I was really sold on it. I, it was going to be. Um, delivered in six months. So I was, I was ready to go for it. This was my first experience with it. Um, I purchased it. Um, there's a picture of me. I'm super happy. I'm a net promoter. Um, 
I actually, I think that they sold 350,000 units. They raised over, I think, $10 million or something like that. I personally, you know, helped sell a couple dozen because I was, I was a big fan and I told everybody about it. Um, so in the summer, uh, I got an email that they were going to be shipping to their beta testers and then start shipping in the fall. And I was kind of confused because the deal that I made with them is that they were going to be shipping in the summer. Uh, and then all of a sudden, it's shipping in the fall and, and it's going to beta, beta testers. I'm still happy. Uh, the beta, beta testing uh, was going good, apparently. Um, and then after the fall and the winter, I got a email to download the app to claim my coin, to put in my shipping information. And I was kind of uh, still happy, but, you know, I thought I already gave him my shipping information. Uh, what's going on here? Um, I was still confused, but the app looked good, and it must mean that I'm about to get my card. A uh, long time goes by, uh, another six months, I still didn't get a card. Um, I kind of pretty much lost faith at that point that I was going to get it. Um, and then a couple months later, I, I finally did receive my card. I was super excited. Um, I immediately, it looked really cool. I immediately put all my credit cards in there put them all in my junk drawer. I was ready to go. I had this card. Um, I was back to being semi-happy there. And then I went to the gas station. It didn't work. I went to um, the ATM. It didn't work whatsoever. Immediately, I'm a detractor. I was completely and utterly angry that I invested all this time. I went through this emotional roller coaster with this company and, uh, there we go. I actually, the, the, the day it didn't work, I gave it to my manufacturer who was visiting from China. And I'm like, tear this apart and see if you can make a battery that, you know, I wanted to make some trackers that were that thin. Um, the tech was cool, but it just didn't work. Um, and then, you know, a year and a half later, I, I Googled it and coin was completely shut down. Um, so they raised all this money. They, uh, they did crowdfunding, $10 million. They raised $8 million. They did all this stuff and, and it shut down. Now, I'm not uh, exactly saying that they shut down because they didn't deliver. A lot of factors were in play. Um, I've never talked to anybody at COIN, but you know, I know that they changed card, credit card regulations. They, um, Apple Pay was, was announced and released, but during the time, um, but I, I couldn't help but think if they delivered within the first six months, would they be able to compete with Apple Pay? Would they be Apple Pay? Would they have been acqu acquired by Apple? Um, we'll never know. But uh, the, it, it, it's just a, a good example of, of what not to do. Um, so we're going to go through some of the top mistakes um, and problems that lead to delayed or failed product delivery to backers. Um, this thing is pretty touchy. Uh, set a realistic time frame to manage back, backer expectations. Um, I've worn a lot of different hats at different companies, and uh, I'm coming here as an operations manufacturing guy. So you talk to the marketers, the CEOs, they're going to have a different opinion here. But um, I really like to, you know, if I say it's going to deliver in six months, to deliver it in six months. It goes back to that net promoter thing and and really taking advantage of hey, I made a promise to my backers. I'm going to deliver them what I said I was going to deliver in the time frame that I said I was going to deliver it. Um, so up front, I really like to, you know, but of course, if you say you're going to deliver in two years, you're not going to get a lot of convergence and it's going to be hard to sell your product. So you have to kind of find a good balance, but I like to set a realistic time frame and try to try to, try to hit that time frame. Um, you got to choose your manufacturing partner. Um, I think uh, that's one of the most important decisions you're going to make. Um, there's a lot of manufacturers out there that say that they can they can manufacture things and they really can't. Um, you need to figure out: Do they already make stuff in the same category that you're looking at? You need to to um, see how many employees they have, how many other other clients they have. Um, I like to go and visit them make sure that everything's on the up and up. It's really important to me that they, uh, they're they ethically um, treating people right. I, I make sure that in person. And then I do it all over again and have a backup. Um, 
a, a company that I know um, that I was kind of helping out with. They they worked with an existing manufacturer that was proven. They had made a lot of products for them in the past. Um, and it was a no-brainer. We're going to use these guys to manufacture the product. Well, we made the right decision to, at the same time, invest a lot of money to get tooling done at another factory as a backup, just in case. Um, turns out that the, the first partner could not manufacture the product. So, um, and the backup just hit it out of the park, just, just, just killed it. And uh, they were able to deliver with, with not much of a delay. So I think it's important to have a backup. Plus, you never know if a factory is going to burn down or get sold, acquired. You never know. So it's always great to have uh, backup manufacturing partners. Um, you know, I think that you gotta you gotta take every scenario into consideration and, and be prepared for that. Um, if you if you uh, you design your product, you get prototypes. By the time you launch your campaign, it could be a year later. If you have a tech tech uh, a, a tech product, the chipset could be outdated and not 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 on the market anymore. So be prepared for that. You got to redo your firmware for that new chipset. Just be prepared for every scenario, and and have backup solutions. That way uh, you can you can pivot. You know, I like to test in real life situations. I get uh, batches of prototypes and I give them out to my friends, family and myself, and I like to just use them in real life situations. I try to break them by all means necessary. If I can break them, then we got to probably fix something. Um, so I think it's important to, uh, to test it out in the real life situations. I, I, I once got a product and, and we were ready to release it. We already sold, you know, ha half a million of them. And I dropped it like right on my desk and it blew apart. It was like a catastrophic failure. So then we had to go back and retool it. And then, you know, uh, a month later, I was dropping it off of the Ortega parking lot three stories up, and it was, it was fine. So um, test it out in real-life situations. Um, based on that, those test results, set up QA, QC processes. Um, all factories say that they do their own internal QA, QC. Sometimes they're great, but sometimes they're just, uh, you know, the minimum that they can do. So... So create a document, create a process based off of those uh, real-life test results. And sometimes you have to build tools um, to, to do this testing. So um, be ready for that. Know the factory timeline and holiday schedules. Um, so, uh, you know, talk to your factories, communicate with them. You... Uh, your campaign ends in October, and your factory says it's a it's a month lead time. Great, you should be able to ship in in November, December, right? No, uh, ask these guys. The, they're getting ready for for Black Friday. Uh, every single product in the world is trying to get their stuff manufactured prior to Q4. So know when they're going to be busy. Factories a lot of times they schedule everything two, three, four, five, six months in advance. So you're going to have to slot your way in there. And if you're a brand new customer, you're not going to get in. So know that. And then know the holiday schedules. Um, factories, they, they take a lot of time off. Chinese New Year, they take two weeks to a month off, right? And then you think, okay, so they're going to be, they're going to be close for two weeks. Cool, I can, I can deal with that. Well, everybody that works at the factory goes home to their little villages, and only half of them come back. So then they got to rehire, and, and you got to deal with that. So talk to your factory. Know don't be afraid to get the, the bad news from the factory. You know, tell them, hey, tell me realistically what's going to happen here. What are we going to do? What's the, what's the scenarios that we're going we're gonna to do? You know, next we come to freight. If something happens here and you've, you've promised your backers at a certain date, and I've been in this situation a lot of times, trust me, uh, backers are passionate people and they get really angry when you don't deliver on time. And it is completely... It's, it's, it's really distracting to a company to, you know, you post something on Facebook and there's 20 people calling you a scam. You know, it's, it's really demoralizing. So know um, what it's going to cost. You need to air freight something instead of ocean freight, which is, you know, air freight is a, is, a, is a week. Ocean freight can be two months. But it costs, you know, 10 to 20 times more. So, so be, pre be prepared for that. and know the pricing in advance. 
know your fulfillment strategy. Um, you know, you might want to sell a doohickey and you're like, well, I'm going to sell 5,000 of these things and it's going to be awesome. I'm going to do it. I'm going to ship them out of my garage and it's going to be super cool. What happens if you sell 50,000, right? I think uh, John uh, was going to do some stuff in the garage, but they, you know, they, they sold tons more than expected. And, and what's your strategy going to be? Are you going to use a 3PL? One thing that I know about 3PLs is that nobody really likes their 3PL. So do the research, find a good partner and a good strategy to get to your, uh, your, your end customer. And then finally, you know, I like to send in batches. You're not going to make, you, you sold a million, a, a million devices. You're not going to make all million up front. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to make uh, 500 and, and do that first batch, send it out to people, send out a survey, figure out what's wrong with it. Because I've never seen a product first time come out completely perfect. So, so get the data, send out NPS surveys, analyze that data, use that data to perfect your product before you spend all your money on, on all your products. And is that it? Oh, I heard so. Okay, so, um, so that's that. We wanted to talk a little bit about the political environment, um, my least favorite topic, and I try to stay out of it. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about it. I, I personally think that right now the, 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 the China stuff and the trade wars and all that, I, I hope that it's a short-term problem. I really do, and, and I, I think that it is. And I think that manufacturing is a long-term solution. So I don't think that that should guide you. I, I, I have people coming up to me all day like, oh, I want to make it in the U.S. I want to make it here. I want to make it here. I don't want to go to China. Um, but the fact is, is whatever product they're working on, nobody else really knows how to make it as well as China does. So think of it as a long-term uh, long partnership, and hopefully this political stuff will, will pass over. Um, and then, you know, Know what your customer wants. I know, I know a, um, a crowdfunding campaign that that put made in the USA all over their stuff um, on their crowdfunding campaign, and they oversold the campaign, and they just literally couldn't make it in the US, and uh, so they had to go to China. And to my knowledge, I don't think that any one of the customers cared or even sent an email that it was made in China. Know if it really, really matters. Some things for sure you got to make it in the US, especially if you're selling to the military or whatever. You got to make it in the U S a lot of food products. I, I personally wouldn't buy anything from China. Um, but just know what your customers want. Um, price to support increased tariffs. I know that, you know, the tariffs are talked about a lot and it's 10%, 25%, 50, whatever it is. I, I, I want everybody to realize it's not 25% of what you're selling to your customers at a hundred dollars. It's not 25 bucks. It's 25% of your cost of goods. So hopefully, you know, if you're selling something for 100, your cost of goods is $25 or less. So you're paying 25% on that. Hopefully you have enough margin built into your business to support any kind of increased tariffs and know that. Um, but, you know, a lot of people have different opinions. And during the panelists, uh, I, I encourage questions about the uh, political environment and see if anybody else has any uh, different opinions. But there we go. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, all right, great. Thank you, everyone. We are going to transition to the panel discussion now. Uh, what I'd like to do is to invite our panelists to come up and take a seat, and we'll join you. Um, Tim, maybe you can share a microphone yeah, that sure way. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tim. And thank you, panelists, for being here. So what I'd like to do is just to start out with a, a brief introduction. Um, so we have Nate Lowry, right to my right here, who is CEO at Brazen Life. And we have uh, Noah Denzel, who is CEO and co-founder of Nomad Goods. And then we have John Stump. Um, who is founder of GoChair, uh, among other things. And so please welcome our panelists here.
Thank you so much for being here. So maybe we, we could start um, just going through if each of you could talk a bit about your company and your products and uh, how crowdfunding played a part for you. We can just start with Nate and go from there. So again, I'm Nate Laurie uh, from Brazen Life. And yeah, so my product and my vision was kind of built off of what I wanted as a former NFL player. So I, I played uh, in the NFL after I graduated college uh, for five years and a few bonus years and uh, really wanted to have a foam roller that I could put in a backpack so that when I was going to the gym or traveling in the off season, I could take care of my body on the road. Uh, there was nothing out there like it. Uh, retired with this idea and didn't know really how to create a product. Um, took over a family business that was selling products, kind of figured out what it meant to run a consumer products business, and then started tinkering with the idea and knew that crowdfunding was probably gonna be the way that I wanted to launch it. Uh, when we got the product to a point where it looked and felt like a, a consumer product, uh, we launched a Kickstarter campaign um, with the goal to raise $30,000. We did 65,000, uh, and knowing what I know now, uh, we could have done way better, uh, but it's a learning process. And um, yeah, and so that's that got us off to the running, and then manufacturing was a huge challenge. Again, things that uh, you learn along the way, and I'm happy to share more about that, but that's how we got our start. Excellent, thank you, Nate, and how about Noah? Hi, uh, my name's Noah Denzel. so yeah, uh, co-founder, CEO of Nomad, we make best-in-class smartphone portable travel products. We keep you charged and protected on the go. And we got started here in Santa Barbara via Kickstarter. Uh, my, my business partner actually got, uh, he, he went to CC and then transferred into UCSB. And so um, I, I took some courses here in high school as well. So it's great to be back here at City College. And we have a few other people at our team. Um, I had heard about Kickstarter. I. I saw the press, or I saw, I read in the press about some other product that was very cool. It was a clock that uh, ticks around once a year. And uh, it was an artistic, cool product. And I had some ideas at the time, and, and I was the type of kid growing up who had ideas and wanted to create something, invent something, but it's so hard to go from idea to production, actually. And all of a sudden, with Kickstarter, it's like, wait, I can just pre-sell this thing to other people? And it was such a cool concept. Um, the idea came out of a need, the need to keep your phone charged on the go. And that, uh, that sort of seed of the idea was uh, what turned into Charge Card, which we launched on Kickstarter and sold 8,000 units, uh, $160,000 or so. I was very lucky to meet a really incredible guy that I mentioned before who became my uh, business partner. And uh, funny enough, we actually, uh, we had a very good energy together, and we actually um, did some early work with John, who's sitting to my, my right here, um, and he helped us kind of bring a little bit of experience to putting some uh, some CAD to these these ideas and helping us get going there, so that was cool. And learned a lot along the way. I would definitely like to second most of the things that Tim said there earlier, and we'll get into that later, but uh, there's a Pretty, pretty much everything he said was uh, pretty, pretty spot on from, from my perspective and experience. And a lot of it had to learn the hard way. Um, we, we often stumbled into these things and, and found out that the factories close a lot longer than one week you know, after the, the, the hard way. And, and now we're like, like so aggressive on planning and everything. So hopefully we'll be able to get into some good material that's helpful if anyone's trying to bring a product through to market. Hey guys, I'm John Stump, and uh, I think I'll talk. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. There we go. So I'll talk about um, GoChair, which is now Click. So we changed names of the product for a reason that's long. But <laughs> so it started out as uh, well. A little background is I'm typically the engineer in town that uh, people call me like, no, he's like, hey, how do you build this? So I really love helping the community. I've been a guest lecturer at the SBCC Entrepreneur Class with John Anton. So I really love helping people bring their ideas. And that's usually what I do. I help people. So this, after all these years of doing this, I said, you know what? Let me do one of my own ideas. Um, and so I've got four daughters. And so I'm always trying to follow them around. And I really just want to sit where they're at and just be there, right? 
So I didn't really, I couldn't, there was no product that did that. So uh, there was these chairs that you had to assemble, and the ones that were assembled were too big, so there wasn't anything really portable. So that, this was something that was my passion project I'd been working on for years. And I think we've been, we worked on it together. A couple, I've, I've been inviting friends, like as a community, like how do we build this thing? It was really hard. And then finally, over all these years, it, it, it happened, and it, I was like, this is it. And so I uh, rallied a, a team of friends, and um, you know, I did a little bit of investor talking to try to, hey, can I get money? And I wasn't one of the guys who could pitch 100 times, right? A couple no's, I'm like, well, okay, I guess that's not a good idea, right? And so that's really, the, my opinion, the core of crowdfunding, because it is daunting to, to launch, and this is a platform where you can take anything in your mind and throw it out there, right? So I really encourage people to do that. And today, you can do it with so much science and testing. You can really hone your message. And in our case, we did, a, we did some of that. And we ended up selling, I think, 22,000 chairs in about 40 days, 45 days. And that equaled $1.5 million um, of revenue off to start a business. So that sounds really good and exciting. And it was, but it was also overwhelming. Because as Tim said, most people are like, yeah, that's cool. Where's my chair? I don't care what you said, where's my chair, right? So it becomes very, I don't say violent, but in the end, when you swipe a credit card, you got a ship, right? So that's, the, that's kind of what today's about, is how do, you, how do you do that, so. Excellent, yeah, great, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, uh, as far as crowdfunding goes, I, you know, I, I, started, um, I started at Tracker um, after my experience with Coin. Um, uh, right in the middle of that, I started at Tracker, and they had done a successful campaign of, I don't know, a million and a half dollars or something like that, and a bunch more on their own website. And uh, it was my first day, and, and I, I learned that they were six months late in shipping, and they didn't really even have a product designed. So um, I was like, hey, welcome aboard. <laughs> so, um, you know, I really learned the hard way on, on a lot of these things. I kind of jumped into it, and... You know, eventually we, you know, we, we, we delivered in batches, uh, the product got better. Um, and then, uh, you know, we, we just, we hit tremendous scale. Um, I, after Tracker, you know, uh, I worked a little bit with John at Tracker and then I, uh, I was sitting at home and I saw some, some LinkedIn post from John or Chris or somebody and, and it said, you know, hey, check out this new chair. And uh, I saw it the first day, and I was like, "Oh my God, this thing's awesome! I got, I got to be a part of this." John Stump, what? So uh, I gave him a call, and uh, I think uh, I started helping him that day, and, and um, I was there to help him through manufacturing. Uh, you know, he, he knows how to manufacture, but it, it took two people on this project. Uh, I've done a lot of little technical electronic products, but uh, you know, a chair should be easy, right? No. <laughs> so uh, so we, we got that uh, successfully delivered to, to backers, and now they're off and running. Um, so that's my crowdfunding experience. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. And so why don't we kind of go into this more with the Go Chair and now Click. So tell us, um, an important thing is the level of readiness that a product is when you go into crowdfunding. So where was... Uh, the chair in relationship to when you started your crowdfunding campaign, you know, where was it and was that a good spot for it to be and do you have recommendations around that? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people when they go to start a business, it's daunting. Things like, ah, I can't, the idea is not good enough, no one's going to buy it. You know, there's all these reasons why your dream can be shattered. It's really hard, right? And so, knowing that, I had some experience. We went into this going, listen, what's the least amount of money to get this idea out, right? Because I didn't want to, <clears throat> other companies, you know, get, you can get money, you can raise money to start, but we just bootstrapped it. So for that reason, we, we did a minimal approach. Like we basically built five chairs, that was it. And we did the video with the five chairs. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I didn't want to overdo it on expenses, right? But I could have I had nicer chairs, but I, that was kind of prototypes, right? And then the name, what was the name? That was probably the biggest challenge of the product, the project, really. I started out with a name called Zaya, Z-A-Y-A, -A, just because I knew that when, you, when you're running ads, you really want to get a better price on a weird name versus 
Go chair was it tested extremely high, but we were competing against other Go names, right? But in the end, we, we had to make a decision and we went with it, right? Um, and then the reason we changed to Click was after we, we ran the business economics, we were basically, you pay money per sale. And we found that we were competing with another Go chair that made it a little tricky for us. And we also didn't, we, we had a theory that we were gonna get the trademark, that didn't pan out. And for Amazon, um, you, there's a lot of advantages to have the trademark. And so we did a separate study. Click was the name we chose because the chair clicks. It made a lot of sense. I'm not necessarily, so the name debate is a big one, right? And when, when you get it right, you get it right. And it is, there's a lot to go behind uh, um, creating a name. And I think we can all think of brands that have great names. But does that answer your question? Okay, yeah, go ahead. Uh -huh. Um, so, John John designed a, a, an amazing chair. It, it, it was great. They had some prototypes done. He had all the drawings done. It was amazing. And it kind of goes back to my speech of um, do real life testing. So, you know, there there was there were some things that were done in nylon and not aluminum that we'd get the prototypes back, and I was the the official breaker. Um, I'd sit on the chair, and, and I broke quite a few chairs, and we'd figure out, hey, this part needs to be more durable. So we'd go through that process and really, really kind of, you know, exactly what I talked about. And, and because the last thing you want, to, you want is a chair to break, you know, after you ship it to a customer. So we, uh, we spent a lot of time. We didn't have a lot of time, but we spent uh, as much time as we could to make sure that this chair was, was tank-proof. It was, it was ready to go, and... and I think John just designed and, and was able to pivot and, and make just a really durable, awesome chair. Yeah, yeah, so great. So what we learned is there was quite an extensive prototyping process, several different samples that came through with some testing. Did you just test that amongst yourselves, or did you actually get it out in who you thought would be your target market? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And I describe, I say, um, designed for customer abuse, really. Because when someone sits down, you know, it's, it's very calm. But when you're out camping, people can be, you know, big, heavy, and pushing around. So essentially, we purposely had to overbuild it. And um, our last test, uh, we were able to hold 2,200 pounds without a failure. So we basically learned how to over-design so we didn't have returns. But yeah, that's it's one of those things that when you see products in the world, like they're done, but when you're doing it, it's really hard because you kind of, as an engineer, you don't necessarily know when to stop because you want to make it better. So it's often hard to say, hey, this is good enough. It passed the test. So we did internal testing and we also tested at labs. And we ended okay. up getting a sort of certifiable camping chair test spec. So that's nice. Yeah. Okay, okay, great. So that gives us a really good um, insight into the you know, the level of readiness and the way of thinking about uh, getting your product to a point where there's less likelihood of it coming back, more likelihood of, cus of the backers being um, satisfied with it. And, and so that's great from our, from like the, uh, the creator's point of view. I'm wondering um, from the manufacturer's point of view, what kinds of things is the manufacturer looking at? Because here somebody is coming to the manufacturer saying, uh, well, I maybe I'm going to have funding. I'm maybe not going to have funding. You know, when, uh, you know, the manufacturer has to be able to make plans that, you know, about is this going to be a go or is it not going to be a go? Um, so, I don't know, Tim, do you have insights into the operations about what the manufacturer is thinking with all of this? Uh, you know, um, in most cases, I'm, I'm able to go with campaign results. I, I think you typically know within a couple a week if, if your campaign's going to do well, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I don't know if your guys' experience, but I, I know in John's case, definitely knew it was going to go really good from, from the start. So you're able to go and say, hey, listen, I sold 2,000 chairs in the first day. So, you know, that gets their ears perked up. And then it helps that I, you know, I, I have um, 
friends and people that have worked for me in the past in China, and I go to the factories with them, and uh, you know, it, it certainly helps to say, yeah, you know, we made eight million devices in my last company. <laughs> so uh, you use that to, to kind of leverage, the, get the factories excited to work with you. Um, and then, but you can't you can't do that if it's if you're not going to sell a bunch because then the fact it's it's, it's a small community, and uh, you know they're like oh they promised all this and they didn't deliver so so you want to be realistic. It's yeah. Simple. So the word will get around if if you go to the manufacturers and you're not following through on some agreements that you yeah I'm going to sell eight million devices next year and then you you don't <laughs> that's a problem. Well, I mean, as a business owner or CEO, I mean, the leader, right, that you need to be, you are selling the opportunity to the manufacturer. So you're actually selling yourself, and you need to get them interested. You know, so there's, you're basically always selling as a business leader. So that's another way to look at it. They have mm -hmm. to come in, because it is very difficult to get a manufacturer to back you, because they're, you have your backers, but the manufacturer, in essence, is investing in this opportunity. So you can kind of continuously have to entertain that thought and make it a reality, right? So it's kind of an all energy thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, great, thanks. And so Nate, I was wondering, um, you know, one of the questions that our entrepreneurs that I hear a lot is, how do I find a manufacturer? You know, how do, what is the process to go through in order to find one? And, and once you found some, how do you vet them? So how did you go about that? Uh, we decided to man manufacture it ourselves. <laughs> okay. Yeah, my, my experience is a little bit different. Um, and it, it, it came from the fact, uh, like John said, of not wanting to spend a lot up front and basically trying to hack the manufacturing process so that we could uh, create components as cheaply as possible uh, and do assembly. Um, I had the advantage of having a father-in-law who had a factory in Romania. That's nice. Yeah. Um, but he was, they do uh, turned precision parts for hydraulics, nothing like creating uh, the morph. I'll actually, let me pull it out so people can kind of understand what, yeah. what we're dealing with. Um, so this is the roller, it folds flat. You know, yeah. um, and then you just pull these two tabs, that opens it up into a foam roller, and then to collapse it back down, you just push and collapse it, and it goes back in your backpack. So, uh, yeah, so we initially thought we would start to manufacture in Asia, and uh, we're kind of outsourcing some of the product development um, and just doing a lot of uh, a lot of trial and error at the factory in Romania. So I was traveling over there. There was one guy um, that we kind of stole from the factory that could could do CAD and you know was handy making tools and that kind of thing. Um, and we we just spent a lot of time just you know fixing little parts of it and trying to make it better and better. And then when it came to actually launch it. We decided to just set up our own shop and do it that way. Uh, having said that, I mean, there's a lot of different components that do come from, from Asia, some from Europe, some from the US. And so dealing with uh, the manufacturers and trying to source components uh, was a lot like what they were dealing with. Like, hey, we think this is going to be our demand. This is what we expect. Give us the best price you can. And then, you know, trying to, we used Alibaba uh, like crazy. Um, and it's challenged without having the, you know, the background or you know, the connections to, to know who to trust. And that was another reason why we decided to manufacture it ourselves. Um, trust is a big thing. Knockoffs is a real thing. Uh, if you do get a lot of traction, you get a lot of traction on Amazon, um, you're going to see something that looks very much like what you have start showing up on Alibaba.com for probably way cheaper than you can make it. So, I mean, like all of those things are, are challenges that you have to kind of foresee, um, make sure that you, that you have IP. But yeah, I mean, those are, those are all hard problems and it's, they're uh, specific, I guess, to the type of product that you want to come out with. Thank you. And so did you have your uh, patent um, before you went into the manufacturing then? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. so we started off, uh, got the product basically to where we wanted, uh, and we filed a provisional patent. You can file a provisional patent for much uh, cheaper than you can file 
a full utility patent. And what that does you is uh, it gives you your timestamp of like, this is my product. Um, you can change the claims and the things after that, but it gives you a year. Um, and so we kind of had this balance of like, we know when we want to launch, let's try to file our provisional as close to that as possible while nobody knows about it. So that we have a year to kind of market test and see how much do we want to invest in you know, continuing the patent process because it does get expensive. Mm -hmm. So trying to you know, balance those things where you want to spend, spend as little upfront as possible, gauge the market as best as you can, and have an expectation of like when all this has to come together to kind of hit scale. So yeah, there's, there's all kinds of things that you, know, you can kind of play with and, and work around uh, in that vein. Great. Thank you, Nate. And Noah, so there's several products that you've brought to market. How did you choose your manufacturers? And do you use it multiple manufacturers in order to bring them to market? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. And I remember myself uh, in the early days really not knowing what to do. Um, and it comes up often in some ways. We're always in the early days of what's on our frontier. Um, I'm still Googling things all the time. Uh, but on the factory front, we actually, initially, we were speaking with John over here, and he knew, a, he knew a guy. So he knew a factory in California. And we started manufacturing there. We thought we needed a manufacturer in USA. Um, and so, so he knew some people there. He also knew people elsewhere. Um, they say in manufacturing, there's three things. There's speed, quality, and price. And uh, you can pick two. Um, if, I, if you're um, getting a, so we found that while the United States can do very precision things, it was kind of slow, it was kind of expensive. Not to say that anything wrong with it so much as uh, we were kind of the little guys that got a little sidelined. Um, I remember we needed to get plastic one time to do a specific thing. And, uh, the plastic was like coming in on a train from Louisiana or something. We were being very specific, like we need uh, DuPont, a certain type of DuPont plastic. Uh, we later uh, sort of just got our butts over to China, to Shenzhen, which is the sort of mecca of, of a lot of manufacturing, in particular for electronics. Um, we showed up pretty raw. Um, I really believe in the philosophy of showing up raw and early is better than <laughs> you know, showing up late. So we, it, it's like you're coming in for a landing. You don't necessarily hit exactly where you need to go at first, but it's, you, you land on that planet and then you can move in. And uh, we, I literally went, remember when we got off, got into China and went to the address. Sometimes addresses in China are like extremely long. And we went to the totally wrong part of the city and they were sort of laughing at us and making fun of us and then we finally, there's like a district called Longgang, and then there's like another city called Longgang. So it was one of the most memorable times in China because we randomly went to this one place and it was very interesting to see. But anyways, my, my advice would be to, uh, we, we do work with multiple now, and you, once you radio in, I mean, imagine if you were trying to find a surfer in Santa Barbara, what you would do is probably go down to the beach and uh, start start seeing there they are and then start talking to them. And even if you knew nothing about surfing, you could start asking around who's good and you start to see like, oh, that looks like catching a wave is a good thing and that one's good at it. Uh, maybe if they're the coolest one there, uh, that's they're too cool for you. You know, you're, you, but, but maybe you find one over on the side that's doing a pretty good job. As a young company, you're not gonna be able to work with the biggest factory. You can find problems of, uh, you could be talking to Foxconn they, they don't care about you. It's, it maybe they're gonna say, hey, you need to pay up front, you need to do this, or you need, to, you need to set a huge order quantity. So I think there's a bit of a trick in finding a factory that, that cares enough and sees it as an opportunity on their side. And uh, in our situation, we had a guy make a small component. He did such a good job, we were like, do you think you can do the whole thing? And um, he, uh, he, it was a real challenge for him because he was a sub supplier. So typically he wouldn't be doing stuff for an end brand like ours. He was using this, he was taking advantage of us in a way, and I mean that in a good way, where he saw it as a growth opportunity. He bought a tool, he bought a, I remember him buying an injection molding press unit for this project specifically. We, our order sizes were a few thousand units. They were big enough for him to be interested. They say that something like you wanna be 
maybe more than like one or five percent of the factory, but like less than 30 of, of what they're doing. Not sure if that's true, but that's we sort of operate on that. And it, you can imagine if you're really tiny, you're going to be back of the line. If you're really big, it gets a little scary because maybe the people you're working with are not qualified enough to be working with you. Maybe they're too reliant on you. Maybe they're going to be charging you too much. So you want to be a meaningfully sized customer. Like John said, you have to sell yourselves. We were, we showed up. We had a lot of energy. We presented our product as if we had, you know, d discovered a new new law of physics or something. I mean, we were excited about our little. Noah is enthusiastic. Let's just say that he he's good at uh, driving uh, excitement. So I think you did a good job there. It's enthus it, it's. Enthusiasm goes a long way. You got to believe in what you're doing. You got to believe in your product. They are taking a bet on you ultimately and with their resources. So they might be like, ah, this foam roller, this chair, this little charger card thing. Meh, but but if these if the people behind it are going to put everything they have in it, if they're going to drive it forward and they're going to like push, put everything they have on it, maybe put the funding on it and Typically with fundraising, crowdfunding, a lot of it does come in the first third of the, the project. So you do get an idea pretty soon. But they see that you got everything on it. You've showed up to the place. You're learning how to suss them out. And you got to do that matchmaking to, to find one that's going to be able to, to work with you. Uh, not too big, not too small, you know, not too, not too perfect. Uh, we, we were very, uh, we had a lot of, you know, rough edges ourselves and as a learning a lot of things we worked with some rough edge manufacturers one of the coolest ones i ever visited was this this guy we worked with he, he was a sub supplier making usb components and it was so crazy to see like raw steel coming in going through all these contraption machines and coming out as usb things and normally when you work you're working further up in the supply chain where the people like that would be sub suppliers so Anyways, get your hands dirty. Don't get it, be afraid to get dirty. Uh, your hands dirty. I always say, drink the local water. It's kind of like bad advice when you're traveling. But what I mean by that is like, go in, get your hands dirty, meet with them, drink baija, whatever you've got to do to learn and build that trust. There's a lot of trust involved. Maybe they don't believe in charge card as much as you do, but maybe they can believe in you. So. That's, that's great. That's a really good point. So the presentation, like you are an element along with the, the product that they're looking at. Yeah, it's a great point. Thank you. And so um, there's this, uh, I'll put this out to anyone who feels compelled to comment on it. There's uh, a challenge. I think this uh, happens especially on Kickstarter where uh, because there is uh, the policy that you either make your threshold funding or you don't, and if you don't, then you don't get any funding, right? And so there can be some strategy to uh, set that threshold to where uh, you're going to actually be able to exceed it fairly uh, quickly or easily, hopefully, and um, but then. I would think that that would be somewhat of a challenge too because you have your manufacturing costs that you have to meet. So how do you come about setting that threshold to where it motivates people to back you but yet you're not backing yourself into a hole as far as the funding and what you're promising backers? I'll, I'll go. Okay. To me, I, I've thought about this question a lot, and I think that you want to set it as low as possible for you to basically accomplish your test, right? Um, Tim said earlier, very few people make money on a crowdfunding campaign. Um, so your level of commitment to the project, if it's purely exploratory, like, I just want to see what this product can do, does it have legs? then maybe you want to set it high enough where like if it does work um, then you have the the you have the funds to go and put something out there because you don't want to put that you don't want to put yourself in a position where you're not going to deliver um, if you're committed to the project and you're like i know this can be a good thing maybe i don't know everything about digital marketing um, that part i don't want to you know i don't know if i know enough right now but I, I know that this, this product has legs and I want to give it some time, even if crowdfunding doesn't go very well. 
then then set it super low um, that where it's at least believable like yeah these this funds can probably get this product off the ground um, but set it low so you accomplish your goal fast so you have that to market off of so if you're gonna go for it, it no matter what set it as low as you can uh, while it's still being believable yeah I you know I have I have s s some clients and and I come on a kind of a different perspective because um, if if you don't hit a certain goal, you're not going to be able to hit your minimum order quantity, right? So my kind of worst case scenario for one of my clients is that they they do just a, okay, right? But I can't manufacture the product. They you know they set it for five thousand dollars and they did five thousand dollars. I can't make anything for five thousand dollars. So um, I think I, I love that strategy, but also it needs to be realistic. If you don't have any other backing or or if you need the money, set it to, to a realistic goal to where you need to hit that. And if you hit that, then you can make the product. But if you don't hit that, you can't make the product. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, I, I guess that was kind of my point too, is like how committed to, to it are you? And do you have the, the funds to push it forward even if you don't have a raging success? You know what I mean? So I, I totally agree with you on that. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, it, this reminds me a bit of, I don't know if you guys have ever done this or had someone do this with you, but when someone's like, oh, you know, you should come to this thing. Oh, this, this other cool person's coming, you should meet them. And then they go to the other person, they're like, oh, you should come to this thing. This other cool person's coming, you should meet them. You're trying to get two things to both seem committed, so then they both actually show up. And I guess what I'm describing is, when you're out there pushing on this, you have to push a lot of things. You need to be fundraising money and then telling the factories like, oh, I mean, we're selling all these units and then you need to be, you need to be selling the fact that you're this big thing and you need to create momentum from within the people. So part of it is you have to, you, you have that drive and energy needs to be strong because, because that is what will allow all these dots to connect. So. I think from our, our perspective, we were over committed, so to speak. We didn't really fully know what we were doing. And um, we set a number that we looked at as our minimum viable number, which turned out to be way less than we would have needed. Fortunately, we fundraised more. So you're always in this pickle. Um, and uh, we picked a number where we said, look, at the end of the day, we could both go out and go, you know, person to person hit, I think it was 125 people a day and just get them to commit to this thing because we're going to hit our $50,000 goal no matter what. I mean, we were like, like, you know, going to be literally actually went out and would knock on doors in the very beginning days and we were just going to do everything. Of course, we learned that it's all about internet marketing and uh, the in-person thing. We printed 5,000 marketing cards. We we're handing them out to people, but we were so driven, but we at least baked it down internally. I think of it, it's almost like Imagine you're an explorer and you have this map and your map is your vision and your idea and what you're going to do and it's your plan. The map's actually wrong um, and that's okay um, because that map is like an early explorer that heard a hint of the new world or something like that. Maybe it came from Asia through the Marco Polo Trail. I don't know. But there was something that drove them to set sail and when they landed where they got it was not actually right. Their theories were wrong and incorrect or whatever, but they had the drive to keep on going. And so when we set out, it was raising 50. A few days into our thing, when we hit 50, our goal changed internally. It was like, our new goal is 100. Our new goal is 150. So you got to be adaptable, and you keep on driving that thing forward. Meanwhile, we're like, oh, shit, we, we need 50. We need 100 you know, to, 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 to hit these manufacturing goals. So have a plan. Be adaptable. You generally need more money than you think you need. Um, if you follow some of the advice that you've heard here on stage, you're, that gap of where you need to be versus what you're preparing for is probably going to be slimmer than ours was. Um, we had the cart in front of the horse for a long time, and we chased it for a long time and, and sort of built our muscle under us. But yeah, I, uh, I think that make sure you have enough in have that drive to truly drive forward and be adaptable to changes because 
whatever you think you're doing, it's, it's probably wrong, and that's okay as long as you, you keep on hitting walls, pivoting, turning, and going forward. Hopefully some of the aspects of that map are correct, so you're at least headed in a good direction. That's great, and it sounds really scary, too. I mean, it sounds scary, very entrepreneurial. Scary and also kind of fun, but yeah. definitely, yeah. It's, don't, don't think of this as you're going on an extended walk in the park. <laughs> right. Okay, so this is awesome. So we've heard, you know, kicking up your entrepreneurial game and mindset in order to stay on the pony, so to speak, uh, with the twists and turns that happen. We've heard about the product development and making sure that it's at a level of readiness that can decrease the likelihood that it would be sent back. We've heard about the matchmaking that's important and the uh, searching for and vetting the manufacturers and managing that, navigate, uh, navigating that. But what about when, re, you know, in spite of all of that, have you had the experience where, okay, it di you're not going to be able to deliver as promised, and then how did you handle it from there with the, cu with the backers? Like, how did you manage that? Because we've heard that they're not happy about it. Well, you know, to me, it's, it's one thing, communication, right? You saw my little thing on coin. There wasn't any communication. I got the product. I was happy again, even though it was so late. But it didn't work. So you got to communicate with your backers 100%. And then you also need to deliver a great product, even if it's going to be a little late. Um, that's really important to me. And I think that's how you, you manage it. I think that's right. Yeah, we, we initially, I think our goal was to deliver in six months, and it took us about a year. Um, communication is key. I, I think we probably, going back, could have written more emails and just repeated what we said in the last email. Because you know these things take a long time. We went into it having a plan for manufacturing, and um, as we started to go into the manufacturing process, we realized one of the main components, our foam, um, wasn't good enough. There was issues with it, and if somebody left it in the car in a warm car, it could bubble out. And we were like, okay, we need to reformulate this. We can't deliver that. The quality of the product is our top priority. And so communicating to that, that to the customers is a big first step and, and doing it in a way that's, you know, forthright and transparent, maybe a little bit funny. That always helps to, to kind of grease the wheels a little bit. Um, but then taking that extra time um, even cemented the fact that even further that we had to deliver something that was outstanding. Um, and that was always the goal from the beginning. But making sure that if there is a delay, it's because you're directing it to be a better product. I think that's a, that's a good way to go. Um, but yeah, I mean, Tim's right when in his presentation, have a backup plan. Um, that's hard to do because it can be expensive. Tooling is expensive. Um, investing resources and having those conversations um, takes time. But it is important if you're going to, um, to really nail down your delivery timeline to, to know that uh, things won't go according to plan and to have, have certain backups for sure. Yeah, um, along those lines, I think validation is, a, is hugely important, meaning a lot of people think, I have this great idea. I'm just going to go do a Kickstarter because I think it's a great idea. But the real thing you should be doing is validating that a million times over in the parking lot, in the grocery store. Will you buy this? Will you buy this? And today you can do that with email campaigns. So it's very, there's so many tools for you to validate so you're not surprised later. Why didn't they buy that? Why did it take so long? So one of the biggest, this is advice I received from the community was, and it's hugely, probably the most important thing I think is, build a pilot and ship it out to the people. And it, it could be 200 pieces, it could be 10. But as soon as you do that and you actually give it to the hands of the customer, all your theories are either failures or wins, right? So the more you can do the validation, whether it's with the product or with internet uh, marketing, in the end, that should de-risk and, and have their less likely problems of you shipping. So you can apply that principle to the whole spectrum. But it's really difficult. It's extremely difficult to ship any 200 of anything because you have to build it but if you can do it guess what you're going to learn all those failures and have more success so we try to push heavy 
to, for people to get the validation done in all um, dimensions because it just makes your business more efficient, you're, spe you're wasting less money, and you're shipping earlier. Fabulous. So uh, kind of just kind of getting to more nuts and bolts. So when uh, you know that it's not going to come through as promised, like how, how frequently do you uh, communicate with the customers? How much is too much and how much is not enough? And, and kind of Noah, you were talking about too, about being in the position of selling, you know, and, you know, instilling confidence and all of that. So what, are there some good rules of thumb for that? Yeah, I'll take a stab at that. So we were backordered, delayed um, from when we, we, I think it's very common, especially a while back, people would be vo overly optimistic on their delivery dates. We, we certainly were. Um, we, and um, we, uh, that's, that happens. I mean, you have to be kind of optimistic. You're sort of in the role of the, of the optimist, of, of you're pushing this thing forward. And if, if it doesn't go as according to your plan, as long as you've made enough progress forward, you can still keep everyone on board. It's like, look, I know we're not at the destination, but like we're almost there. And then some people keep on coming along with you. Now, we made a decision early on that when we were delayed with the deliveries, that we were going to deliver something to people every Friday. So I totally understand the coin thing. I think I backordered that too. Um, I was very excited and sort of follow these different things. Um, I remember hearing that the average delay is like eight months or something. I don't know what it is now, but when I heard that I was relieved because we were around that, I was like, oh, we're average, that's good. <laughs> um, but we, were, we never felt like that up front. We were very concerned um, about it. So we did these, we, we made this decision, hey, let's give them something every Friday. So on our Kickstarter update, we did these collages and they started very simple, like picture with subtitle, and then it was like every Friday afternoon, we were like pictures, like text, like this word, not that word, and do this whole like layout, like we were in yearbook class or something. And um, it was this story of the manufacturing and we were learning along with them. And since we were manufacturing in California, which I don't necessarily recommend, it depends on what you're doing, we were able to like be there, get the photos, and like we were very involved and we were like, so it's sort of like this slow reality TV show where like, oh, we're sonic welding. You know, sonic welding is when you use the ultrasonic waves to connect plastic. And, and um, so people follow the story. And, uh, you know, we had, let's say we had a bunch of Tims and these, these enthusiastic net promoters, I hope. We were able to string them along genuinely um, through delivering them information, which, which is, you know, it's content. We, we, instead of delivering the thing, until we were ready to, we delivered content. We skipped a Friday or two in those times that we did. I felt so bad and we noticed how important it was because people go, where's the Friday update? And it's like, <laughs> does that really matter? I mean, don't you want your thing? And it was kind of like, yeah, we do want our thing, but until you give us our thing, we want the thing. So if you can set good expectations and hit those expectations, maybe they're not as good as like producing your thing early, which no one does, but if, if you... And then another thing I want to say is, Shipping. So no matter how good you are at making stuff, even if you're the world's best at making stuff, everyone forgets that they're shipping. Sometimes people don't even save the money to ship. So we kept on doing sales after our Kickstarter, so be ready to hit the ground running. But like, all of a sudden you're like, cool, let's just say that you're on time. You made, you sold 10,000 widgets for $10 each. For, you know, so, so like, uh, this is, this is um, $100,000, and uh, you, uh, or, or what, would that be a million? Um, <laughs> so so you have, you've collected all this money, and you um, have to, you've made all these things, you've spent all this money making it, inevitably it costs you twice as much to make the stuff, so then you have to, you have to ship it. Um, Shipping's really expensive, you know, shipping 10,000 things. Maybe you don't have a discounted rate yet because you're small, so maybe all of a sudden you're like, everything's good, we got it, we made it all, and now it's all stuck here. Oh, by the way, your customers, half of them live in these convoluted places that are hard to ship to. It's really hard to ship to Brazil, for example. Um, and uh, the, it's hard to ship to certain countries in Europe. Germany's very strict on their customs things. I mean, and, the, and by strict, I mean they, do, they just do it properly. Um, 
And so it's very normal to forget that you are a shipping and delivery company. So make sure that you factor those things in. Any buffer that you build, you're gonna, you're gonna need it. You don't wanna just be running on the, the thinnest of margins where you're able to make all this stuff. Um, so, so really think about shipping. One big piece of advice I would say up front is, you know, think about scaled shipping now and think about a lot of discounts. There's a lot of discounts depending on how you do this, but you think you're building a product and you are, but like all else aside, you're a shipping company and you gotta get good at that and you need to be a pro at that. Maybe it ships directly out of Asia to international or whatever it might be, but uh, we've done a lot of weird shipping stuff. We've, we've used the Swedish postal system to ship directly internationally from Hong Kong. Um, so there's a lot of things that you, and we didn't do that at the very first, it took us time to, to learn about some of those tricks and they're, they're powerful. So just get ready for the next step. Have a, don't just be thinking about, oh, we need to make stuff. No, we need to make it, we need to ship it. We, are you thinking about next products for people? What's your, what's your roadmap looking like? You don't just wanna make the stuff. You wanna be shipping new stuff over time. Yeah. Excellent, that's great, thank you. Hey, I want to um, put it out there that uh, if you have some questions that you'd like to ask, we have uh, Dennis, over, uh, we need to do it by the microphone because it's being recorded. And so you can just step over to where Dennis is and we'll be happy to take some questions. Okay, great, yeah, great. Great, let's move Excellent. into some questions, Q&A questions. Uh, hi, my name is Carlos. Um, I have a list of questions here, but let's focus. I know you're a pain because I was a bucker uh, last year and they delayed for one year. And I was tracking them down. I created a website where I gathered all information about the founders, but I got the product. So now I, I know the, the feeling. Which product are you talking about? Uh, it was a smart luggage. I'm not going to oh, talk okay. about it. Yeah. Um, my main question, like, yeah. I know as a founder or as a creator, we need to think about so many things that it's overloaded and overwhelming. But, and you need the validation as well. If you don't validate your idea, it's nothing. And I don't believe in best or bad idea. I believe in fast exec um, execution. Uh, my main point is between the validation, sometimes the pain of your products will take longer than the normal, like maybe years. Validation versus copycat. How to handle with that? Because I've, uh, I've seen good products on Kickstarter or uh, other yeah. Clickstarter. I can comment there. I guess it's not a question of if you'll be copied, it's when, right? So, and typically you won't get copied until you have success. So that's, there's a little paranoia as a founder but protect yourself with patents. We, we just we shared with you options, a couple hundred dollars to $5,000. So, and we're here to help you too, it's confusing, but there's a lot of things you can do to, to protect yourself. But it's a tough world. If you have success, guess what? People are coming after you, be flattered, right? And how do you solve that? You invent again, and you're the market leader. So you have to, you have to be extremely aggressive. Expect to be copied, and if you're surprised, well, that's your problem, right? I think also it's it, it, choose the right manufacturing partner. Um, you need to, uh, I, I like to uh, refer and use manufacturing partners that aren't going to be selling stuff out the back door on Alibaba. Um, and yeah, I don't think, you know, on Alibaba you ever saw a real tracker Bravo um, copy, but there was plenty of tile um, copies. So, uh, because we had a real, real secure factory, and uh, we, we made sure that it, that it was as a trusted partner. So, it's 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 one of the things that you need to look at when when choosing a, a partner. Thank you, Carlos. Yeah. Hey, we have a question from our live stream. Uh, this is from uh, Marcos from Brazil. He asks, if there were two things that I should absolutely not do for crowdfunding, what would they be? Who'd like to take that? Two things that you should absolutely not do. Noah? Um, don't, don't lie. Uh, there have been crowdfunding campaigns out there that have not been totally honest. Um, yeah, you need to 
sometimes if you're over enthusiastic, you can be wrong. Um, hey people, there's a really cool party over here, let's all go and you show up and it's not quite as cool. You believed it, now you've got a bunch of people there and they, they're trying to have a party, maybe the party can still happen. Um, so so don't, don't lie, um, you do have to string things along and I, that's understandable um, and, uh, and yeah, so. I've got, I've got another one. Don't don't think you can just post your you know shoot a quick video and post your project and think that it's going to get any traction. Um, a good Kickstarter campaign has a lot of, a lot of work that goes into it beforehand. Um, it's well thought out. There's been a lot of money probably put into marketing beforehand to get a, a big backer audience um, that's ready to pull the trigger when the the project goes live. Um, there's a lot of resources out there. There's a lot of companies that can take you through that process. I would suggest finding one. Um, and, and even though you're going to give up a portion of your margin, um, if, you're, if your goal is to really test the legs of a project, you want to make sure that you have professionals uh, getting it out there in the world to see what happens. I think uh, it's important. You know, a lot of, a lot of crowdfunding companies they're they're brand new at this um and they don't re there's no roadmap for it uh don't spend your backers money <laughs> before you deliver the product it's really easy to do it's it gets exciting marketing's working you got return on ad spend i just got a million dollars from indiegogo let me put that into marketing and sell a bunch more it might not keep on going like that and then uh you know I've, I've heard of companies that have to raise a bunch of money before they can fulfill their products. And uh, you're sitting there waiting on, on funding. And I think anybody that's ever funded here uh, knows that it just snap your fingers and get money. It takes, it takes a while for that to happen. So uh, don't spend your backers' money. Really good. Thank you. Um, there's a, another question that came through. Um, Benjamin was asking, how do I ensure customers that resources are being used efficiently when you experience delays in production? I think, Noah, you were actually talking really well to that in terms of including them in on the journey so that they're able to see how, uh, how you're progressing and um, how the because of the things that you're accomplishing, how the money is being used. Is there anything to add to that? or? Uh, communicate. So, um, if hopefully you are aware that you're going to be doing a lot of communication or you're going to hire someone that's going to be doing it or you're going to sort of get your friends and family members to help, help you do it, um, we did all those things. And make yourself available. A lot of times when you say, look, here, if you have an issue, you can follow up with us. Here's my email. Here's my phone number. First of all, don't hide. Some of these, a lot of companies hide and it's crazy. I see them like, like these people are angry and they're writing and they're commenting and stuff. Get back to them. Show signs of life. They're going to be way more understanding than you think, but they need some information. So don't, don't hide. And then I've seen these comment threads like, where's Billy? Like he's hiding. Like he's probably on an island somewhere. And it's, and it's like, no, Billy's not on an island somewhere. He's freaking out. He's in China. He's... He, these entrepreneurs doing these things, they're working really hard and they're, they get scared and it's understandable. They, t they get in over their head, they take on too much. But what happens is if they stick at it, maybe they make some mistakes and they do have to raise money to deliver. That's not the best thing necessarily to, to do, but no one's gonna do all these things perfect. We're up here on this stage probably because we've made a lot of mistakes and kept forward uh, with, had the tenacity and wherewithal to stay forward. So just communicating, you know, sending a little message. They see this, they see it's a real person behind it. It's not just a talking point. Being honest, like we thought X, but it turns out that Y, and then we're now they're trying this new program called ABC, uh, you know, and you, your answers probably get better over time as you learn more. So information, honesty, um, just straight up communicating with them goes a long way. It's, it's so one of those things where when you don't know what's behind the, the sort of this curtain, you often assume it's a lot worse than it is. They're probably just laughing. They're probably sitting there with all the product, just just you know, laughing, drinking champagne. You know, and it's like, no, we're freaking out. There's no champagne. Um, we're yes, we are staying up late, uh, drinking some beer sometime, 
brainstorming how we can get this thing forward. We're, every day, every energy, you know, you all the energy you you people are trying to deliver. So usually there's just a little bridge of communication that goes such a long way. And I think on top of that, it's, it's good to it's good to keep in mind uh, after you've gone through one of these things that there are a lot of negative comments out there. But I, I always like to keep in mind that for every negative comment, there's probably, you know, I was I was pretty mad, but I, I never made any comments. There's probably hundreds and thousands of people that aren't making comments that are that are fine. And you know, there's there's actually people that I've seen on campaigns that I've been involved with that that they they write, hey, you guys are doing a great job. Keep it up. You'll get through this. I don't even read that or even look at it. I look at the negative one. But why am I not reading the positive message? I think you got, you got to keep that in mind. Um, and for, yeah, for every troll, there's 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 a, a bunch of great people out there that support and believe in you. But just communicate with them. Yes. Yeah. Really great. We're reaching the end of our time, but uh, I wanted to point out something that I have heard all of you say is that you weren't lone rangers in it, that you had a team around you that was helping you through all of this because it sounds, you know, really challenging or at least kind of emotional roller coastery. <laughs> um, and so I think that that's uh, a really important thing to point out. Um, I was wondering, after you went through all of this and you crowdfunded and you brought products to market, what's life like on the other side? Um, so actually, Nate, I want to ask you, you know, once you had successfully crowdfunded, did that set you up um, to do other types of fundraising? Yeah, yeah, so we, um, we were lucky enough to be kind of put in contact with one of the producers of Shark Tank. Um, that got us in that ecosystem, and uh, we were able to be on the show. And um, that, you know, Shark Tank is an awesome experience. Um, it's such a good platform for uh, putting your product out in the world because so many people watch it. Um, they do a good job of getting to the essence of the business, and um, the pitches the pitches to the the actual sharks are much longer than what you see, uh, and they're they're you know made digestible for TV, um, and they do a really good job of you know showing what a company is about, and um, yeah, and that that's it's like a, it's like a Kickstarter on steroids with a, an injection of HGH or something. Um, for us, we were, yeah, we um, kind of had a lot of the same growing pains after that that we did on Kickstarter, uh, but it's just amplified because, um, yeah, so many people watch it. We were on back order for a long time. A lot of the things that we learned uh, from, you know, being delayed on Kickstarter, we had to then apply uh, and, and figure out new processes for really communicating with a lot of customers as to why the product was taking so long to make. and. Um, yeah, yeah. There's there's all kinds of ways to to go out and and raise money and uh, find publicity, and uh, yeah. I mean, I think if you're if you're aggressive enough, if you're if you hustle enough, um, you can find ways to to get some uh, some publicity for your company um, without having to just spend all your money on Facebook ads. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so cool. So it's like. Crowdfunding just in itself, it can be a primer for moving on to experiences like Shark Tank. And I just imagine, uh, you know, your experience after having gone through that, it must have accelerated you so much as an entrepreneur. Well, I, th I think, you know, you asked the question, it's like, what's on the other side? It's, you just, you, you fulfilled all your backers. Are you you're mm -hmm. just happy? You're, you're going to an island? No, <laughs> no. So, so it's always what's next. Uh, in our case, it was it was selling, it was raising money, it was going, going to retail, uh, cash flow. There's always something, and you know, I haven't ex personally experienced it, but you know. And then I, I, I've heard, talked to people. You IPO. Now you have a whole new set of problems. Now you you got stalkers, you got shareholders. You know. So I I don't think that there's ever you know, the island or that I've ever experienced. I'm, you know, s some people probably will in their lifetime, but I think it's a, it's a constant battle and it's just about pivoting and uh, just working through that. You're going to come up with problems constantly. Just, just how do you deal with it? Right. Thank you so much, everyone. So 
I think that brings us to the end of our panel discussion. Um, but what's great is it doesn't have to stop here. So for those on the live stream, uh, we are going to continue the conversation with you. Uh, any questions that you leave in the comments section or on our social media, we'll continue uh, to bring content to you, ask, uh, giving you the answers and, the, and pointing you in the direction of the resources that you need. For those of you here um, uh, attending live, what's great is we get to now go onto the patio, enjoy some refreshments, including a ton of pizza that I ordered, <laughs> and uh, we can continue the conversations there. Um, what I want to do is thank all of our panelists. Thank you, Tim, for being our keynote as well. This type of education of people who have been there, done that, and are steps ahead of where these students and entrepreneurs are right now is just so priceless because it's, it can't be learned in a uh, textbook, you know, and um, the fact that you're willing to share so much your experiences, it can help uh, these people who um, utilize this information that you shared so that they don't have to make some of the same mistakes and we can stand on each other's shoulders as we continue moving to make the world an even better place to live, right? So thank you so much. Thanks, everybody.